The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Brian Donlevy in Navy Doctor. Many of DuPont's better things for better living serve us in ways of which some of us are completely unaware. A chemical compound known as titanium dioxide, improved in DuPont laboratories as a pigment for paint, is used to make more opaque the thin paper such as that used in airmail stationery and in Bibles. And one of titanium's many war jobs is its use in paints which provide protective and camouflage coatings for military installations and equipment. Tonight, with Brian Donlevy as its star, Cavalcade tells the story of one day in the life of a Navy doctor. His official title is medical officer, but to the men on his ship who spoke of him with deep affection as Doc or Serge, he holds a special and hallowed place. Even in peacetime, his is no simple medical post, but in war, with shells bursting overhead and fire raging in the holes, the Navy doctor's coolness and courage have made him time and again one of the true heroes of our era. Our radio play, written especially for Cavalcade by Paul Peters, is based on the experiences of Commander Charles F. Flower of the Astoria and stars Brian Donlevy. Seventeen years ago, Dr. Charles F. Flower came out of the University of California Medical School and hung his shingle on a battleship. The months after Pearl Harbor, Dr. Flower was medical officer on the Astoria, a 10,000-ton heavy cruiser attached to the Pacific Fleet. Then suddenly one day, he sat hunched over a table in a strange cabin on a strange ship, writing a letter home. My dear wife, you know, as well as I do, dear, that I'm not very good at this. Somehow, my fingers are always clumsy with a pen. Give them a hypodermic needle or a scalpel, and right away, they feel at home. But you've begged me so often to write to you about what you call my exciting life at sea that I'm snatching a minute after a pretty crowded day to drop you a line. Besides, just now, darling... I guess I feel the need of talking to you, of being close to you. The day began with an operation under somewhat trying circumstances when our ship was undergoing... An operation under somewhat trying circumstances. That's what he wrote his wife. Here's what really happened. The date was August 8th. The Astoria was slipping silently through enemy waters, screening the landing of Marines on Tulagi Island. At 10.30 a.m., Raymond A. Willis, pharmacist's mate, first class, knocked on the medical officer's door. Dr. Flower? Oh, come in, Willis. There's a man in the sick bay I think you ought to look at, sir. Oh, who is it? Cutler, Bill Cutler. Gunner's mate, first class. Well, what's the matter with him? Stomach, I think. Run the temperature. Looks pretty sick to me, doctor. Very well, Willis. We'll see Cutler. Yes, sir. All right, Cutler. Well, Cutler, what's the trouble? Well, sir, it's, uh, it's like a stitch in my side. Mm -hmm. Almost takes my breath away every time I bend. Let me see. This the place? <laughs> yes, yes. Excuse <laughs> hurts, me, sir. Huh? Yes, sir, that hurts. Mm-hmm. You been feeling bad long, Cutler? Well, since yesterday morning, sir. No, sir, after meals? Well, to tell the truth, doctor, I haven't felt much like eating. And when a sailor can't eat, he must be pretty sick, huh, Cutler? Well, it's nothing serious, is it, Doctor? Well, the sooner you have it out, boy, the better. Yeah, that's it. I... Have what out? Acute appendicitis, Cutler. Calls for an operation. Oh, an operation? Now, sir? Now, right away. But, Doctor, I gotta be at my battle station. You're going to bed, Cutler. Take your clothes off. Go on, strip. Sh 
shucks, Doctor. I'll miss everything. Well, think of the nice long rest you'll have afterwards. Two weeks in the sick bay with nothing to do but eat and smoke. Uh, Willis. Yes, sir? Get this man ready for the operating table, Willis. What kind of anesthetic, Doctor? Spinal. Tell my assistant, Dr. Brown, to administer it. I'll be right in. Uh Uh-uh. What's this? General Quarters. General Quarters. Man all here to aircraft station. Well, excuse me, Doctor. I'll see you later. Cutler, Cutler, you come back here. But, here. Doctor, I've got to get to my battery. You go to the operating room and take your clothes off. Oh, I can't miss this show, Doctor. You're under my orders now, Cutler. But I've never seen one before. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll leave the loudspeaker on. You'll be under spinal anesthetic so you can hear everything anyway. Now, come on, off with that uniform. Yes, sir. Operator? Yes, sir? Captain Greenman on the bridge, please. Captain Greenman speaking. This is Dr... Flower in sick bay. What's up, Captain? Reconnaissance plane sighted two Jap carriers north of Tulagi. We may be attacked any minute. Captain, I have a gunner's mate here with a gangrenous appendix. Can I operate? Well, it may be tough going, you know. We'll be on a zigzag course, full speed ahead. Well, this boy can't wait, Captain. If that appendix bursts... Then operate. I'll try to warn you before we commence firing. <laughs> Well, Brown, is our patient already? Yes, sir. Preoperative and spinal administered. Right. Now, Cutler, let's see. You feel anything down here now? No. No, not a thing, Doctor. Good. I'm just kind of drowsy, like uh, like floating in air. Mm-hmm. I felt this way once when I was a kid and smoked a reefer. A, a, a reefer? Oh, oh, only one, Doctor. Yeah, I, I got it from a trombone player I knew in Chicago. Scalpel. Yes, sir. You won't tell on me, will you, Doctor? Man all battle stations. Enemy torpedo planes and dive bombers sighted to stop it. Man all battle stations. Hemostat. Here you are, sir. You know, Doctor, I was just thinking. Catch that spurter, will you, Brown? Yes, sir. Now, look, if the ship gets hit with all those hatches secured, how do we get out of here? We'll get you out of here. Scissors? Scissors, sir. Here they come. Batteries, topside, boat and aft. Get your altitude. Hemostat. Yes, sir. Hey, that sounds like my battery. Okay, you lie down. Strap his chest down, Willis. Oh, Doctor. Take it easy, Cutler. Take it easy. Yeah, but I gotta get How out. How do you expect the doctor to do good tailoring when you're squirming around like that? There goes one of those buzzards. Smack into the ocean. Well done, battery one. Well done. Hey, it is my battery. It is. There goes another. It's exploding, exploding in midair. Brown, give me a tie. Here you are, sir. Stay down. If those bombs don't get me, that knife will. Stop drowsing. You've got a ringside seat, haven't you? There goes another. And another. Need any help, sir? No, no, thank you, Brown. I'm just waiting for that vibration to stop. The destroyer Jarvis has been hit amidship by a torpedo. She's on fire. The magazines are exploding. Hey, Doctor, they got the Jarvis. We're crying out loud. Lee, still, will you? Needle holder. Here you are, sir. They're going overside. A crew's going overside. Hey, it's sinking, Doctor. The Jarvis is sinking. Suture. Yes, sir. Here come the fighter planes from our carriers. Abdominal dressing. Oh, I can't stand this anymore. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Hold him, Willis. I got him. They're knocking them out of the sky. Hey, look at those chaps hightailing it for home. Well, there you are, Cutler. It's all finished. It's over, man. All over. Just a minute. Here's Captain Greenman. Well done, men. Well done. Now I want all hands to stand by. We're going to bring the ship around and pick up the job of survivors. All hands, stand by. Well, Cutler, my lad, in two weeks you'll be as good as new. Hey, Willis, open the hatches and start those air blowers going, will you? I'm dripping wet. He wrote his wife that it was an operation performed under somewhat trying circumstances. And as he remembered the events of that fateful day, he told her other things. Well, dear, you'll be pleased to know that we weren't hit at all. As for casualties, all we could dig up was three fractured big toes among the ammunition handlers. It seems that in the excitement of their first baptism under fire, some of them foolishly dropped shells on their own feet. Of course, we had the survivors from the Jarvis to take care of, and that was quite... Of course, we had the survivors from the Jarvis. One hundred men, packed between decks, in wardrooms and galleys. 
sick bay crammed with fractures, burns, and wounds. All day long and late into the night, no rest for the Navy doctor. At 1 a.m. Well, you must be kind of poop, Doc. Why don't you knock off and catch some sleep? I can't sleep. Now, Brown, how's our man Cutler? Oh, he's sleeping like a baby, sir. We got him loaded with morphine. Mm. Well, why can't you sleep? I don't know. A hunch. I've got a hunch. <laughs> you always have hunches, sir. You're famous for them. Well, I've been in the, at sea in the Navy for 17 years, Brown. I've got so that I can smell trouble. Smell it miles away. Oh, oh, this is a trouble hunch, is it? Yeah. Brown, the Japs are coming back. They've spotted us, and they're coming back. Oh, go on, get some sleep, Doc. You're dead on your feet. Those men. Those poor devils from the Jarvis. Well, what have you got an assistant for? Let me take care of them. I don't like this. It's too dark tonight. And too quiet. Oh, come on, sir. Why don't you lie down in your bunk for a while, hmm? Well, I uh, got some casualties bedded down there. Well, in my cabin. Now, please, Doc, be sensible. Oh, all right. But I don't like it. It's too quiet. In his letter home, he wrote about this, too. This is what he said. You know me, dear. How cross I am when I don't get sleep at night, so it was a good thing in view of what subsequently happened that I caught sufficient rest, for later on when I was... Sufficient rest. It was 1.30 when he went to sleep. It was an hour and a half later when an end came to the quiet and sufficient rest. What? Well, what's that? What? Oh, so they did come back. Operator. Operator, the bridge. Give me the bridge. Phone's dead topside, sir. I can't get through. General quarters. General quarters. Man all battle stations. Three jet cruisers and two destroyers attacking three points off starboard bow. Secure all watertight hatches. Secure all watertight hatches. Forward batteries. Shoot those jet lights out. They've got them pinned on us. Dr. Flower. Dr. Flower. Number one turret has been hit. Prepare the sick bay for casualties. All right, men, all right. Now listen to orders carefully. Where's Dr. Brown? Here, sir. All corpsmen present. Take two men and man the after battle station. Very well, sir. Gomez, couch, come with me. Yes, yes sir. sir. You three, join the repair parties. Forward, topside, and aft. Yes, sir. You two, decontamination stations. Yes, sir. Now, men, for most of you, this is your first surface engagement. This is what your training as hospital corpsman has prepared you for. You all know your duties. Yes, sir. Until the fighting is over, we'll be locked up down here. So steel yourselves to hang on and take it. It sounds easy, but it won't be. I can promise you that. However, I have a hunch. Oh. I have a hunch that you'll see all the action you want afterward. Now... Since the intercommunication system and the loudspeaker are dead, you must rely entirely on my orders. Any questions? Suppose we get a shell hit below deck, sir. We may have to abandon the sick bay. In that case, we'll put the casualties in zipper stretches and take them up to the wardroom. One thing more. The ammunition handling parties are passing five-inch shells right outside this door. For your health and theirs, keep out of the way. <laughs> All clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now scatter and lie down. Conserve your energy. Yes. All right, face down, everybody. Aye, aye, aye. Listen to that. We're sure taking a pound. Yeah. They must have sneaked up the whole Jap fleet on us. I bet they're catching it topside. Yeah. Dr. Flower! Dr. Flower! Dr. Flower, where, where are you? I'm here. They opened that door and let the smoke out. The smoke's coming in from the ammunition handling room, sir. The sick bay door's blown off its hinges. Well, <laughs> Get those battery lamps going, will you? Hey, Wagner, yes, Becker, yes. light the battery lamp. Uh, where do we find them first? That shell must have blown everything right through the bulkhead. Yeah, wait a minute. Here's one. <laughs> That's better. All right. Who's missing? Where's Palmer and Morrow? Here they are. Both of them, Doctor. Gone? Looks like it. Uh, that piece of shell must have... Cover them up. 
What about that ammunition handling party outside? Shell hit right in the middle of them, Doc. Huh. Your treatment room, the dental office, the pharmacy, all smashed to pieces. Uh-huh. Nothing but a heap of junk out there. Wait a minute. Somebody's still alive. Willis, check every one of those men. Aye, sir. Wagner, yes, sir. you come with me. We'll go through the sick bay occupants. Yes, sir. Hey, Doc, is the ship going to... Relax go- now, Cutler. You relax. You've missed it twice. You're getting to be shell-proof. It's a miracle, Doctor. But the sick ones are all okay. Good. A real miracle. One of those ammunition boys missed it, sir. And, and he's just plastered with wounds and flash burns. All right, bring him in here. Get him right over here on this bunk. Yes, sir. Becker. Oh, boy. Morphine, sir. Oh, aye, sir. Wagner. Yes, sir. Tannic acid jelly. Uh, here, sir. Uh, uh, don't boy. touch me. Don't touch me. Well, now, this won't hurt so much. <laughs> there we are. In a minute now, the pain will stop. Take his uniform off. Uh, you better cut it off. No, no. Go on, go on. It's uh, painless as slipping off a glove. No, you can't. Uh, now your pants, boy. Uh, uh, boy. Can, can you lift the other leg? Oh, I'll try. Uh, that's it. Uh, hey, watch out. There's $40 in those pants. He'll get well. You are listening to Brian Donlevy in Navy Doctor on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our play continues, Dr. Charles F. Flower, played by Mr. Donlevy, is medical officer aboard the Astoria, a heavy cruiser which screened the landing of Marines on Tulagi Island. When his sickbay is struck by a Jap shell, Dr. Flower tries to move his casualties to the wardroom. But fire drives him through hatches and up ladders to the main deck. Dr. Flower. Is that Dr. Flower? Yes, we had to abandon the sick bay, Captain. Direct hit in the ammunition handling room beside us. Oh, thank God you're safe, Doctor. We need you. Look at all these wounded. Yes, sir. Where's my assistant, Captain? Did, did Brown come up from the after dressing station? Cut off by fire in the stern. Oh. Must be 50 men down there. We've got a repair crew trying to reach them. You firefighters, never mind the bridge. Let it burn. Get below and flood the lower magazine. Aye, sir. Aye, sir. You'll have to find shelter somewhere, Doctor. Try the bosun's locker. Uh, w- one, one question, Captain. Yes? How bad are we hit, sir? Where it hurts, Doctor. Down to the bone. Forward engine room knocked out. Stern shut up. Ammunition ready boxes exploding. Fire spreading to the magazine. They must have pumped a hundred shells into us. And if that lower magazine goes up... It'll blow the bottom out of the ship. Yeah. Well, the Japs are gone, I see, Captain. You certainly must have given them a bellyful. At least we kept them off our transports at Tulagi. Uh, uh, Captain, do you think... Do you think we'll have to abandon ship, sir? She's still on an even keel. We'll make a fight for her. Working with flashlights, dodging the explosion of ammunition ready boxes, gathering up the casualties, hurry, hurry. Here a shot of morphine, here a burn dressing, there a bandage or a splint. But that isn't the way Dr. Flower described it in his letter home. I won't describe the next half hour to you, dear. Just routine duty, caring for the wounded who are lying all over the deck. Dr. Flower, Dr. Flower, uh, I've been looking for you here. Oh, who is it? Chief radio man. You got it bad? Won't make it. Wouldn't let me do anything for him. Kept saying, it's no use, Doc. You're wasting your time. Oh, maybe he's lucky. Stop that, Willis. I won't take that from you. Not from you. Not even with a lifeboat shot to pieces and the magazine's going up any minute? Scuttle, but the skipper's going to flood them. Yeah, you mean he's trying to. Willis, look, I'll not have you... T- All right. You said you were looking for me. Yes, sir. Those men in the captain's cabin, sir, I, I think we'll have to move them. The serious cases. The heat's coming through the deck from the wardroom fire below. Well, we can't put them out in the open. No, sir, not in this weather. All right. Put them under the overhang of number two turret. Get blankets from the living compartments. Right, sir. No, no, w- Willis. Uh, wait a minute. There's something else I want you to do. Yeah, yes, doctor? We're uh, uh, running out of supplies. You want me to get some for you? You think you can make it to the sick base, sailor? Down through the fire? And you know about the magazines, of course. I'll make it. Well, if you can't get back through the hatch to the wardroom, try climbing up through number two turret. 
Uh, I'll get back. First, I need morphine and dressings, then all the sulfur, tannic acid, and iodine that you can carry. I'll fill up a sea bag for you. Good luck, lad. Fires beyond control, crews exhausted, medical supplies depleted. And in the glare of the burning bridge, the Navy doctor coolly treats the captain for burns on face and hands. There you are, Captain. That'll have to hold you for a while. In the morning, I'll try and make you a dressing, sir. In the morning, eh? Uh, no luck with the magazines, Captain? Some of them. But not the lower ones, sir? I don't know yet. You've done a great job, Doctor. If we come out of this, I hope you're on my ship again. Thank you, sir. We'll come out of it, Captain. One of your hunches, huh? Yes, sir. One of my hunches. Captain Greenman. Captain Greenman, we can't make it, sir. Try again. We've tried everything, sir. It's no good. It won't work. Lieutenant, you're commander of the firefighters. Get down to that lower magazine. But there's nothing to work with, sir. Power's gone. No pressure on the water mains. Use hand pumps. Hand pumps? We can't get near enough. Can't sir. get near enough. It's the fire, Captain. Don't you understand? It's a matter of minutes now. The lieutenant's right. They're a good crew, but they're human. They can't perform miracles, Captain. Give order to abandon ship. Yes, sir. Put all stores you can aboard the life rafts. Every man has five minutes to get his belongings. Very well, sir. Then call your firefighters off the magazines. And get them through to that party trapped in the stern. That's one miracle we will perform, oh, sir. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. My, my pharmacist mate, Willis, he's down in the sick bay. Willis? Yes. He just came up with a bag full of medicine. You'll find him down at the bosun's locker, sir. They're bringing him to. What? All hands stand by to abandon ship. Prepare the life rest. Stand by. You're right, Doctor. Some miracles nobody can perform. Captain Greenland, side of the ship, Captain. Where? Broad of the starboard beam, sir. No lights on her? No, sir. Isn't that one of our destroyers, Captain? Well, she's maneuvering to come alongside. Signalman! Signalman! Yes, sir. Use your flashlight. Tell her to identify herself. She's flashing us, sir. B. A. G. L. The Bagley. It's the Bagley. A skipper used to be my chief engineer. What's she flashing now, Signalman? What can we... She says, what can we do, sir? Tell her. Tell her, come alongside bow. Take off survivors. Yes, sir. The Bagley. The Listen to those men yell, will you, sir? You'd think that that little tin can was the prettiest sight in the world. I bet there's going to be some celebration when this crew gets to port, Captain. One of your hunches, Doc? Yes, Skipper. One of my hunches. And so, my dear, that's all there is to write about now. At 5.30, after the men in the stern had been released, our transfer was completed. At 6, the lower magazine went up and blew the bottom out of the old USS Astoria. And that, darling, was the end of my day. Now, I think I will take everybody's advice. I'm going to lie down and rest a while. Your devoted husband, Charles. That's what the doctor wrote to his wife. But the fact is, in the crowded sick bay of the Bagley, this Navy doctor's work began all over again. Thank you, Brian Donlevy. In presenting tonight's play, DuPont is honored to pay tribute to the valiant officers and men of the Medical Corps of the United States Navy. Mr. Donlevy will return to the microphone in a few moments. Meanwhile, here is Clayton Collier, speaking in behalf of DuPont, to tell you how chemistry transforms such a common material as salt into potent instruments of war. Salt comes from the Latin word salarium. Salarium meant salt money, the part of a Roman soldier's wages he was paid in salt. Salt goes to an American soldier, although he may not realize it, as part of his armament. In a DuPont plant at Niagara Falls, salt is melted by heat generated from electricity. This molten salt is electrolyzed, that is, broken down by the electricity into its elements, sodium and chlorine. 
From these materials, one a silvery metal and the other a greenish-yellow gas, dozens of compounds are produced which have a bearing on the war. Tetraethyl lead, an important ingredient of high-octane gasoline, is made from compounds derived from both sodium and chlorine. The gears in a tank or truck or the prime mover that drags a heavy gun must stand almost unbelievable punishment. So they are given surfaces so hard that not even a file will scratch them. The hardening is done with sodium cyanide, another compound made from salt. The valves of a combat airplane engine would grow so hot they would melt if the tremendous heat generated by the motor were not carried away. This dangerous heat is controlled in many planes by making the valves hollow and filling them with sodium. The sodium melts and transfers the dangerous heat away from the valve head. From salt, modern chemistry also produces textile bleaches and dyes for uniforms, pharmaceutical chemicals used by Army and Navy doctors, non-flammable solvents to remove the grease from metals, electroplating chemicals, and scores of other compounds. The white crystals you use on your dining room table, of which the United States has enough in Michigan alone to last for millions of years, are transformed by the chemist into supplies and equipment for our troops on the fighting fronts. Common salt, thanks to electrochemistry, yields these wartime adaptations of better things for better living through chemistry. And here is Brian Donlevy, star of this evening's Cavalcade. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Because the Christmas season is approaching and because our play tonight was about doctors, I want to tell you a little story of something which happened in Wilmington, Delaware in 1907, 36 years ago tomorrow something which has meant the difference between life and death to untold thousands of people. That day, a valiant, resourceful woman sold the first Christmas seals, designed by herself and run off by a local printer to raise funds to support Wilmington's small tuberculosis sanatorium. $3,000 worth were sold. That was the beginning of the Christmas seal sale in America. Since then, sales have amounted through the years to $123 million. This money spent for hospitalization, treatment, research, and education has brought tuberculosis down from the first cause of death in this country to the seventh. You have done this with your purchase of Christmas seals each year. And I know that this year, too, you will not fail. Thank you very much. From Wilmington, Delaware, birthplace of the Christmas seal... DuPont is proud to salute Miss Emily Bissell, who designed and sold the first Christmas seal. This year of all years, buy Christmas seals, use them generously. In the bleak, desolate Arctic outpost where they serve, they call themselves the FBI. Forgotten Babes of Iceland. Next week, Cavalcade stars glamorous Rita Hayworth in the role of a Red Cross recreation worker in Iceland. Our play, Check Your Heart at Home, is a bright romantic comedy with music based on Jane Goodell's bestseller, They Sent Me to Iceland. DuPont invites you to join Cavalcade's audience next Monday evening when it stars Rita Hayworth in Check Your Heart at Home. The orchestra and musical score tonight were under the direction of Donald Voorhees. Cavalcade is pleased to advise its listeners that Brian Donlevy may soon be seen in the new Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Technicolor production, America. This is Carl Frank sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is the National Broadcasting Company.